Hey guys, welcome to episode five on the rebuild of a basket case Harmony H1213 archtop. Yeah, and there's going to be even more episodes after five is done, but I have a story about the number five that's very near and dear to my heart. I came home one day and I said, do you know I got the highest score in the third grade math class and I was not a particularly good student as is evident in my Lutherism skills even today, but I wondered and I expressed this opinion. Is it because I was born Ken that I got the highest math score in the third grade class? And I was told, no, it's not because you were born Ken. It's probably has something to do with the fact that you're 63 years old. Okay, painfully traumatic for me. Anyway, I want to tell you, if you haven't seen the other episodes, go up there. There's a playlist up there. But the real, the purest Luthiers, they realize this path has no end. It has no end. And from the moment that I picked up this guitar. I picked up a lot of guitars, but I have never picked one up that I didn't look close enough to figure out that its body was literally fluted like a pumpkin. And so after you put down that 80 bucks or that 100 bucks, then you get home and you go, what did I do? And now hours and hours and painful hours later, you end up with something that looks like this. Wait, there's more. And this, look at that. Yeah, patients out of recovery, people. Now the fun starts. In all seriousness, guys, I have told you before, taking the back off an archtop guitar is a big mistake. Because when you do that, it changes a lot of different things about how things line up. I mean, I have a question for you. If I measure this, from here to here, and knowing that it's domed, and I push down on on the concave part, will that not serve to kind of extend this out and this out so the measurement would be longer? Same thing for the sides. When you got a waist in there, it starts getting all cattywampus and the sides of the guitar, and the top, and the bottom, without them being all together, they're flimsy. They're very flimsy, and I've shown you that before. So, we are going to continue to work on getting this body back together, which means putting the neck back on, getting the angle right. And we're going to do that by making this guitar body believe that its back is on. So this is you people that believe in faith and be by faith and whatever. Well, I'm fixing to give you some of that because there's a lot going to happen here. Once that's done um, and we get all that figured out and it comes, comes time to put this back together, we are going to stain this, which means, by the way, who would ever take all of the finish off of a guitar body, all of it? I don't know if it's kit guitar, you're starting off making one out of fresh wood. That's a whole different thing. But I'm going to have to stain this one up, and there's all kinds of stuff to go with that. And one of those things, you don't touch it with your fingers. So suddenly this thing is going to be going from the, the guitar that only I was stupid enough to buy because, yeah, this path has no end to something that's got to have rubber gloves and all that kind of stuff on it. So I can talk all night, but let's get to the bench and let's figure out what it takes to put this back together. This is one of those episodes, just like the last one, number four, was full of structural stuff you'll not see anywhere else. So if you want to know about stuff you should never, ever do to a guitar, stick with me here. Let's go to the bench.
Okay, guys, let's get rolling here. Um, in all seriousness, I want you to remember that the stuff you see on this channel, don't go out and tell your friend, oh, I can fix your Gibson arch top and do it this way. And that's how Ken would do it. Don't do that. Just look, we're looking at extreme cases of stuff. Now, you'll remember from the other episodes that this, this back of this guitar was bowed up because it had a brace missing. And we, you know, did all this to it. This is how they used to do it in the old days. They would put fabric. It wasn't this big and all this mess. But anyway, now it's going to be time to put this thing back together. And... You notice there's still a couple pronounced cracks, and instead of using a paint, by the way, all the finishes on these Harmonies and Ks, they had people that could paint. It wasn't stain. It wasn't any of that they would paint it on. And somebody stripped this one down. But we are going to end up staining this, and I'm going to use a couple of natural stains that you've seen before. But anyway, you'll notice that there is a pronounced crack right here. That when we pull this down, it will try to seal up. You see what's happening here when I do this? And then there's one here. So we are really going to have to hide those. So I want you to remember that when we're working on this guitar, once we get done with the sanding stuff, we're going to put rubber gloves on because we are not going to end up with a bunch of fingerprints that are going to mess up our stain. But here's what I need you to think about. You can use a scraper. You can use a razor blade that's taped off a thickness of scotch tape will protect this part anywhere where the scotch tape is from being scraped. But I can come along and work this crack and you'll see that there's dust coming off here. Don't get all excited. The 90s are over, people. No Studio 54 or 57, whatever it is. You see that right there? Uh-huh, sit down. Anyway, what I need you to think about is in order to hide these cracks, you don't do it with a different color wood. You need this color wood. So whenever I'm doing any sanding or body work on this guitar, I want to put this in a tin right there because I am going to be mixing some white glue with a little bit of water. And as I work this over, I'm going to push this down and get that crack to seal up. So again, get a small tin and know that you're going to need a little bit of sawdust. So we're going to end up going over this thing like this. And like I said, it's going to produce some sawdust. But we need to get this down to the wood. So I'm not going to bore you with that, but we're going to do this everywhere that fingerprints or anything has touched this guitar. And again, we're going to push it all into a pile and dump it in to our tin and then we're going to dump the tin over at the last second and cuss and that's not going to be good okay so you see that never dull there's never there's never a dull moment on my channel that's right so let's talk about a little math here now if I want to test a palm tree say for example I don't have a palm tree here, so I'm going to reach into the wind can and pull out the love pencil. Say this is a palm tree. And I want to calculate when the wind blows it around and all the leaves up here are moving around like this. And I want to calculate how much force is being put on this trunk right here. I actually thought about doing this one time. I actually wrote a paper about thinking about doing it one time. Because I am a palmero in reality. So, if I want to know how much this pencil is bending under a certain amount of stress, I would put an anemometer up here, wind speed calculator, and then as this goes back and forth, I put a wire between a post here and one here, and do the same thing on the other side. So when the tree started to flex this way, this wire would get shorter, and this wire would get longer, vice versa. You follow me here. So the, the wire getting pulled tight like a guitar string would become thinner or it would relax and become thicker. If you put an electrical charge on both of those wires it will associate a value to that. I want you to remember that. It's called the strain gauge. Now we'll put the wink pencil back in here temporarily. I would hate to lose that. It's very valuable to me. 
So, when I go to put this back on here, and this is one of my major warnings, if I line the top to the top right there, you see that? Now I want you to watch what happens if I press on that. You see that? That is moving. You see that? Now, let's say I put the top on here, like so, and it stays right there. And I look back here, well, this body is sticking out over the end a little bit. And it's sticking out a little here and here. Now watch, if I hold the top and push these in, the sides are moving. So the moral of the story is, if I want to do some work inside of here, let's say I want to put a T-nut in here and run a bolt coming through the neck this way so I can bolt this on. And I do this and put the neck back on the guitar without the bottom being on, this will flex all over the place. Look here. And each of those movements affects the length and width of the body, would you agree? So back to the strain gauges. If I push this this way to get the body lined up, or I press down on the body, here's a good example. Think at the minutia level, like, like your mother-in-law thinking about all the things that are wrong with you that she doesn't like, that level of minutia. If I push down on this, if the body goes down because it's concave, does it not get longer and wider? So always remember that. I'm beating this into your head for a reason. So I need to know where everything is going to be when this body is pressed down, that was why it was really important that we got all the bows out of pumpkin. And we need to know that measurement and what it is. So before we start doing anything with this, what we are going to do is we are going to measure this right here. From here to here. And I have a fancy yardstick. It doesn't get any fancier than this. This was on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, believe it or not. It's an old one. So I'm going to take this end here, the stupid end, and I'm going to put it at the very back of the guitar right there. You see? And then I'm going to put a piece of tape up here. You see that? We'll make sure that this is at the back end of the guitar. Now it's going to want to jump off because there's more hanging off the end. And I'm going to put this again over the top at the end, like so. You with me? It's really important that those two line up, not so much the sides. Now, I'm going to look at up here, I'm going to be back in the wink can for the love pencil again. I want to know where the end of the body is up here at the tail block in relation to this neck. Everything back here has got to be at the end. Has to be. Right at the end. A millimeter will matter. And I'm going to come up here. Look where this lines up. I'm going to push everything the way I need it to be. I need a couple more hands. But I'm going to make a mark on that piece of tape. You see that? Now, I'm going to put this down. I'm going to kick it over and make some more scratches in it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and make sure that this is at the end right here. Even with the end. And you can see there's a couple holes there. And I'm going to put a pencil marks where those holes are. And then I'm going to squat down on this a little bit. And I'm going to pull that neck until it's right there. And then I'm going to make marks in these two holes. So what's going to happen here is I'm going to drill a couple holes. Here, 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 and here. And I am going to put screws in here. And what will happen is this guitar will think that the back is on because this 
ruler will take on the structural significance of the back. So let's do that first. Okay, so that is lined up at the end. I'm going to drill a pilot hole. One. Two. We're going to leave that right there. We're not going to drill the other holes just yet. Now I have a box of screws that I call tailpiece screws. I'm going to put one in each one of those pilot hole jobbies that I just drilled. Okay. We'll make sure still that everything is just right. And you're going to say, oh wow. You didn't just do this. Yeah, I totally ruined the guitar, guys. Okay, and we'll try to keep that in the middle. Like so. There we go. Now, we'll keep these drills. Keep this drill close. And you can see, if you watch real close here, I can move this fairly easily. But that mark, I got my fingers hooked in the block. And that line needs to line up with the top of the body. It's really important that that pencil mark lines up with the end of the body. Bear with me here. I always keep these in the drawer. Because if you don't, I have like a, a really cool set of drawers over here. But do you see that? See how that's right at the end? This body will not flex now. And when it comes time to set the neck, it will not move right here. And believe this or not, but this being loose right here, if I get this much off by this moving right here, guess what? The neck angle will be a mess when you're done. While I am here knocking the camera around, I want to show you that, remember when we pulled the neck off in episode two, and this was all bowed up right here, I've got this to clean up and I've got this to clean out and now we'll start figuring out what the neck angle needs to be. I've had the neck as we steamed it off sitting over here for quite some time under tension and clamped down. We've got a couple frets to put back on. We want to get all of that done before before we put the neck back on. We're going to put the neck back on before before we put the back of the body on, we're going to put the electronics in and all the scrap brass input jack before we put the back back on because it's much harder to do it after. You're going to see little clips of me. I always tell you, I'm just going to show you a little bit, then I won't shut up, but that's what we're going to do. We're also going to go around and do all the work on the body. Again, we're going to be sanding everything. I'm going to take off the tailpiece, but we're going to go everywhere where there's any kind of anything on this body because when we stain, we're going to end up with a problem wherever there's a fingerprint or something or glue or anything like that. So there's a lot of work. I'm going to show you little glimpses of me doing it here and there, but... Just grab some popcorn and say, man, look at that. I would never do that to a guitar. You're going to be surprised at the end, trust me.
Now, when you're taking parts off these guitars, don't forget you got your muslin bag over here and your piece of tape that you're going to put all your screws on your original parts because someone will want these. Okay, that orbital sander done a lot for us. Notice I have the rubber gloves on. And um, anytime you go over a, a surface now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a piece of Wipeall 80. W-Y-P-A-L-L -L is actually a paper towel meant to replace rags. And as I've told you with my uh, kit guitars, when you take one of these rags around... Lintless, dustless, it doesn't hang up. And if you're going over the side of a guitar and you don't hang up anywhere, it's pretty good to go sand it. Remember, this thing was sanded in the factory. It, it was good enough to accept paint. But we're going to continue to open up a new surface. And then we're going to take naphtha here. And what this is going to do is any stripper that's been on here, any fingerprints, oils, or anything like that. We're just going to put a little bit on here. And you're going to see it vaporize off very quickly. We're going to work in areas. Remember that chalk that we had there? Yeah, there it is now. We're going to go along. And this is a spirit. And it's going to vapor off. And it's going to get us down into that wood grain. Now, you'll see if there's cracks or anything like that, that will show up. Yeah, you can buy naphtha in some states, but in others you can't. So you got to turn to this stuff here, which I'm not going to endorse for this. want to remember when you're using this here in the shop, you don't put this on a big, huge table and get it all soaked up because this stuff is highly flammable. You want to remember that anyway we're going to go around this whole thing until it has been wiped down and the wet edge goes away and then anytime after that we touch this we are not going to pick it up with bare hands and we're going to make sure that there's no lint on this thing and we're going to do that by having the wipe all rag around but you're going to watch us use some kind of weird stain here. It's going to transform this thing into something. You're going to go, okay, I get it now. By that time, the price will have gone up. Well, I don't want to get into all that. You just need to make sure you keep working and save up that money because you are going to covet this thing. Okay, now I want to show you something. We are going to do a sunburst on this thing. So I'm going to take chick flick teal chalk and I'm going to go up to this very scientific measurement that's part of a cubit, which was the distance from your fingertip to here. I guess everybody had that same measurement. That's why everyone hates the metric system so much. But I'm going to come up to that first knuckle joint right here and I'm going to draw some lines right here. Like so. Because what's going to happen is this is going to be the extent of the sunburst mark. And inside of that is going to be the other color. You follow me? And they're going to be two different things. My, how scientific, right? So I'm just going to go along and connect those dots. Something like so. See that? Perfect. This is going to come in handy doing the back, too, so I don't 
want to lose this until the guitar is done. Okay, now while I got the camera set up right here and I drew those chalk lines there, I've got my little my little bottle of shellac that I made myself. And you see that I'm just doing these circular motions and working this stuff in. Now it's spirit based too. So it's kind of got some Everclear in it. And we're just going to go right up to that chalk edge like that. And this is going to take numerous, numerous coats of this stuff. Stuff was made out of a tree. Sap that comes out of a tree that I work with. And um, but I'm going to take it right up to that chalk edge like that. And we're just going to go around and around like this. And you can probably put on about three coats of this a day until it gets to the final color you want, which I want this to be an orangish color. Now, as I go along here, I'm looking very carefully. Again, this is a white ball rag. I'm looking very carefully to see that there's not spots on the top where the guitar is rejecting the stain. Now I'm going to have to put the neck back on up here. So I'm going to want to make sure that this is all working good. Again, you know how sunbursts are. They're kind of intermittent. So that chalk line is just kind of a, a guideline. And there's going to be some blending going on here because the other color I'm going to use is also stain based and uh, a portion of that is also also natural yeah this is tedious monotonous work but yeah like when you feel the paper being tugged on by the finish you want to move on you got to keep the edge wet so we'll let this dry and then come along you can do about three coats of this a day. So this mimics the French polish thing, which you're going to see us do on a Gibson round hole arch top. See, this isn't so crazy, huh? Good luthiers know how to do this. They make art out of it. They make it look like glass. We're just coming along to that edge there, and it's getting increasingly orange with each progressive coat. That's what we wanted. Once we get done, before we go on to the next coat, we'll run some 0004 steel wool over the top of this and get anything out of the way. It's not there. Not supposed to be there. Starting to see the orange yet, pumpkin? Okay, I'm getting a little bit ahead here because I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this part just to kind of explain the basics to you. What's going on here is that we've got a sunburst. We've got a uh, a lighter orangey pumpkinish color and we've got a dark color so um, how we came up with this is you'll remember we wiped down the whole guitar with naphtha or lighter fluid just to watch your lighter fluid make sure that there's not a bunch of stuff in there residues and stuff that's gonna mess you up but once that's done you basically go around this is Eucalyptus Kino, it's spirit based. It's uh, one part um, eucalyptus dried sap off of eucalyptus um, cider oxalon, which is red iron bark. And then we also used a product that you're used to me using, which is oak gall ink. So this is basically something as simple as this you can take sandpaper. Um, 
prep the area again with naphtha go along again you can use a, a fine grade of sandpaper like 400 you come along and you sand with the grain now you can tell here that there's some spots here this is going up and down notice I have rubber gloves on I don't want to repeat this because I got fingerprints you notice that there was a crack right there all this stuff is going to show up and this thing is anything but even but you take uh, sandpaper and if you are going to use spirit based stains or oil based stains you're going to need to do some work in between coats because it'll gloss over it'll get shiny and then it will reject other coats anyway if you're going to use steel wool zero 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 four four aught steel wool come along like this now if you're going to do that get a magnet and just go along because you don't want the steel wool fragments ending up you don't want stuff sawdust all of that so any of this you do you're going to come along after you do that and you are going to do naphtha like so it makes it look like it, it got shiny all of a sudden but it's going to vaporize off and it's going to make the area ready now there's a couple ways that you can put this stuff on you can use a, a brush at first a rag um, when it gets down into this kind of stuff, like if I want to put on um, another coat of oak gall ink, I'm going to use the cap like this. I'm going to pour some in there. You do not want to get that anywhere. I'm going to take one of these daubers. They used to use them or still do, I guess, on um, crafts where you put stencils up on the wall and then you just pat in stuff. But you just... And daub it on there like this. This works pretty good when you're trying to get that broken pattern at the edge of the sunburst pattern. You see that? You can just go like that and just go along. It'll start to it'll start to get sticky, especially spirit-based stains. You don't want to work. A wet edge of one stain while you're working a wet edge of another you also don't want to get this stuff in uh, on top of the other color um, when it comes to ragging this stuff on if you're going to use rags use wipe all 80 uh, paper towels and I just basically take one of these these are available in the travel section where you go in and and, and um, get little containers but I can just drop this on here I can do this and just put a little bit on there and I'm just gonna go along like this the spirit stain stuff you can tell when you're gonna get yourself in trouble because it will start to stick to the rag that you're using when it starts feeling like something's grabbing back at you move along but you can see in the sanding here there's been a couple spots here that stick up higher than others and I can just put that on there like so and let it sit a little bit and daub it on there like that and then come along like this and just work it in keep the wet edge moving drop a few drops like that you hear that helicopter there's people that want to know my recipe is pretty bad but anyway that's kind of how it works i'll catch up with you in a little bit
the closer you get to being done, the more you're going to walk along the line with a little bit of naphtha and just kind of blend that line like this. Because you're looking to get a little bit of each color to mix in. Now if that rag starts grabbing you, you're going to want to get away from it, but keep things moving. You see how that's working? You're just going to go in a circular motion. Again, if the rag starts grabbing, you can feel it. It's pulling on you. Don't worry about the rag being dirty. It being blended like this is actually going to help you make it look like you've got a better blend along the line there. There you go. It's tedious work, but remember, it's a junk pile. Who cares, right? Okay, guys, we're doing the last little bit of the steel wool. This is the part where you got to be really careful so you don't end up with a line anywhere because this stuff was just glanced off the edges in the factory. They had people that were really good at making this work to get this effect. Again, don't get going in a straight line or a curved line. It's easy to do, but we just want to go along the edges of the F holes like that just a little bit. You see that there? Now, I'm going to let all this dry up. Notice that this crack. Come on, Chick Flick T.O. Pointer. Hey, did you know Gallia Volt is going to be on 60 Minutes tonight? I wonder if one of my guitars is going to show up there. But you see that crack right there? That's reinforced underneath really heavily. So it kind of is going to give it this aged, beat-up junk pile look. Imagine that. And of course, when we're done, we're going to go anywhere where we've used the steel wool and pick it up. See that there? Yep. Can't beat these things. Anyway, we're still going to do the back. But again, don't get in a circular motion with this. Just get along the F holes and give it a little bit of, a little bit later, we're going to go over this and we're going to French polish this thing so it's going to look really deep. But it'll be like this. I think this turned out okay. All right, guys, there is the back. We're just knocking down a couple of these drift in spots just real rough you want it to blend but there you go all righty then i think this is a good place to put the skids to this episode some of these episodes are getting an hour long i think we've come a long ways i think that that's going to look okay it's going to look really okay when we get some french polish on it people say why would you french polish a guitar like that and I would say, why is it that you do not grasshopper? But the body has come a really long way. This thing had a lot of issues. We still got that little telltale bow there. But once this all comes together, it's going to look pretty cool. It's going to look cooler than it did. You're going to be able to look inside, see that chick flick teal stuff and go, oh, I know him. It's like elf. I know him. It's Ken. Okay. So, I hope you're learning a lot about these guitars, like mainly that if you buy one and you look around up here and you see something's shifted back or the edge of the body doesn't line up or there's a, a crack up here where the block is and everything's falling down, you saw that, that's a ghost, right? Anyway, you're going to look at this and say, you know what, there is a correlation between where the body is, the signs you're reading on the body, and where the neck is. And sometimes just because the neck doesn't look right or it's even missing, or it will be once you get done learning the lesson the hard way, that you put a lot of money into these things. So if you're going to put a lot of money into an archtop guitar, I want to tell you about somebody. I want to tell you about Dan Cohen Top. Look at this cool shirt. He's in Los Angeles, California, and he builds great, great arch tops. So, I don't know, you can stick 80 hours into one of these, or maybe you can start off 
now that you know what's inside, you don't have to investigate. You've learned that at my expense. Now maybe check out Dan and his great work below. Whether you buy something from him or not, anyway, have a look at his work. Great arch tops. Um, I actually saw his work at the Rocky Mountain Arch Top Festival. So we're going to bunch this up. I'm going to put a couple more coats of that secret sauce on here and get it ready because once I start French polishing this thing, I don't want it to blend out and all that kind of thing. We're going to move on to the neck now. And if you thought there was a lot of work on this, guess what? You haven't seen anything yet. I will see you in a little bit as soon as I change shirts and make it look like a bunch of time went by when it really <laughs> it didn't. Give me a like. Thanks for watching and stick with me on this one. The playlist will appear at the end. And I swear between this one and the Galliano junk pile, there is nothing that could be severely wrong with an arch top that we haven't covered. Thanks and see you soon.